muscle group is covered by uh, multi-joint exercise, is there any value in adding single joint exercise? And, and um, I know we've, we've discussed this before, and in one of your papers, it showed a flexed arm circumference was slightly bigger with a single joint, but it might That's be right, more yeah. significant, though I can't remember. Uh, it, uh, it was, it was, it re did reach statistical significance. Um, practical, meaningful, significance, questionable. I think it was something like uh, 3.7 to 4.6 percent were the differences between the multi-joint and the multi-joint and the single joint groups. Um, but it did reach statistical significance. Um, I think this is a, this is a really a really good question. Uh, I still err on the side of including some single joint exercises in my workout, but I include them at a peripheral level, so I include them f on my limbs, so I still do knee extension and um, maybe remaining deadlifts for hamstrings, um, albeit that that's a multi-joint exercise, but there's a focus in my mind on the hamstrings. Um, I still do bicep curl, I still do tricep extension. I don't very often do any kind of isolation movement for the deltoids, anterior, uh, medial or posterior, I very infrequently do isolation exercises for the pectorals or the lats. Um, I think that we can probably, you know, know that they're being hit sufficiently well with the multi-joint movements, um, but I still, Im oh, well, I, let's face it, I like to train arms. There you go, I said it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this may well lead to regional yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. And, and I think that a lot of it is going to come down to the, um, maybe the intensity that people can train at, uh, maybe the uh, technical elements of the exercise. Uh, you know, we, we could start to look at the, the, an underhand, a neutral, an overhand, a pronated grip for pull-ups um, and so forth and things like that. You know, um, if we looked at, you know, a leg press, then where's the foot position on the board? If we look at a squat, we could look at, uh, again, uh, maybe limb length and lever length and how well that might load the quadriceps compared to the glutes or hamstrings and so forth. Um, I tend to think things like the knee extension is key for elements like the medialis of, uh, of the quadriceps um, and really getting that contraction at the top end and stabilizing the knee joint. Um, I tend to think that there's a good argument for training the hamstrings um, in either a unilateral or in a single joint movement. Um, again, that's something that maybe I, I can't back up with, with research right now, but I, you know, from my own experience, experience with clients, um, and, and again, like I said, the biceps and triceps, I think. I, I, that said, I would always do them at the end of a workout. So they would be kind of supplementary rather than the focus. Um, but when, I, when I talked about this at the resistance exercise conference um, last year or the year before, the way I talked about this was that we should focus on quality exercises, not quantity of exercises. So instead of trying to cram in 12 exercises into a workout, let's get the right exercises done in the right way at the start of a workout. And if there's still time at the end, then we might add in a set of bicep curl or tricep extensions, whatever it might be. And Skylar Tanner, you know, gave the perfect example talking about his facility, that at the end of a workout with a client, he has a tendency to say, is there anything else that we should finish on? Is there anything that you feel like we haven't done enough on? Any muscle group that we haven't done enough on? And if they say, yeah, let's do the biceps, then he'll throw in a set of bicep exercises or whatever it might be. So, and I think that's a really nice approach. Very practical and, and can address something that can be underappreciated sometimes, which is psychological needs. Absolutely, absolutely.